Dr. Kursik is going to present on uh, topical corticosteroids. You are not going to want to miss this presentation. And um, without further ado, here's Dr. Leon Kursik, topical corticosteroids. Thank you, Joe. And sorry, guys, it's me again, before lunch, after lunch. <laughs> so uh, the next uh, half an hour or so, I'm going to discuss about uh, topical corticosteroids. But the first part of this talk, it's a little bit interesting. It goes back to history of the topical corticosteroids. And so how did, you know, we use them every day, but do we ever think about it? Where did they come from? How do we use it? Um, so I decided to take a short trip back to history, and most of those slides actually are um, compliments of Dr. Joe Baikowski and Dr. Uh, Bira Iber. So in the beginning, back in 1940s at Mayo Clinic, two of the doctors, uh, Philip Hench and Edward Kendall, they sort of came up this new compound called Compound E. And when they administered it to RA patients, all of a sudden, all those patients who were almost crippled, they couldn't move. It was wonderful. They felt so good, and they were able to move freely without any pain. That became a big thing, as you can imagine. And Life magazine called it an important discovery, as important as penicillin and almost insulin. So, of course, that took us to the 1950 Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine for those two doctors. On the East Coast, meanwhile, um, they also tried it for topical uh, steroid. And then, uh, finally, at NYU, Sulzberger tried it for, dermat uh, for any dermatosis, and they called it compound F. Here's the problem with it. It was very expensive. It was difficult to produce. It came actually from the bile acid, uh, di deoxycholic acid. They had to kill 40 cattle in order to get, and it took 36 steps, in order to get one gram of 1% hydrocortisone. It cost $200, uh, 200 per gram. So you can imagine the cost of a 60 gram tube. And people think about biologics now, how expensive it is. Can you imagine for one gram of tube in 1950s, 12,000 bucks? So they wanted to do something that, you know, this is the molecule, by the way. They want to do something that, what, uh, you know, how to cut the cost, of course. And they uh, thought that maybe they can come up with some kind of a synthetic product or something from a chemical plant or something that they can come up with. And finally, somehow, they ended up with this mislabeled sack of seeds of Strafantus sarmentosus. I cannot even say it, but it's a flower that here I'm going to show it to you. So that's exactly what happened. And they found out this uh, flower that basically contains a molecule, contains a material just close to cortisone. So the question becomes, how can we turn this into uh, cortisone? So at that point, Harry Truman basically said, OK, uh, we need to find this an important medication. He actually literally signed an executive order to search of a plant that can be found either here or somewhere else that will make the cortisone production easier and cheaper. So they tested literally more than 5,000 different plants to find out what looks like that cortisone molecule or what would be easy to come up with something that they can convert it. They literally tested more than 5,000 flowers. So meanwhile, in uh, 1936 in Japan, Japanese, they found a um, chemical in the tubers of the Asian yam that's called Dioscara tocora. And that basically had that similar structure of the cortisone, and it, they called it diosgenin. So those are the formulation of the diosgenin versus the cortisone. So it was sort of an easier uh, conversion of the actual cortisone. Meanwhile, in here in the US, a chemist called Russell Marker at uh, Penn State, he basically, in his lab, he was working on that too. And Eventually, he identified this plant um, in Mexico. Basically, it's a, it's a plant that's, um, that is called Mexican yam. Absolutely nothing to do the 
potatoes, sweet potatoes. And basically, this was a huge plant that uh, it almost weighed up to 100 kilos, and each tuber contained up to 5% diosgenin. And you can see the picture. That's called Dioscorsa mexicana. So what does he do? He leaves his job at Penn State. He packs up. He goes to Mexico City and he hires workers, and basically in two months, he gathers almost all gatherable Mexican yams, and he starts a corporation. Guess what that corporation was called? Syntex. I remember when I was a resident, Syntex was still around, and they actually had Sinalar. So they were the first one to come up with trimnicillone and flucinite. They also came up with the birth control pills with the estrogens, progesterone, and androgens. So it's very interesting that even 20 years ago, this company was around. But then, Mexican government gets really upset, and they decide that they basically have to want a share of this profit. So they nationalized all the yam business, and they kick Russell Marker out of the Mexico, and they have a monopoly on the raw materials and process of the steroid production. Meanwhile, in the US, they finally they tried very hard to grow those Mexican yams, but they couldn't do it. But eventually, they come up with the full lab synthesis, and basically, they are able to produce um, the cortisone that we use today in, um, in, the, in production, uh, and not really necessarily from the Mexican yam, but more synthetically. But the bottom line is they still use the Mexican yam. So that's the end of my story. So let's go take a look. How do the steroids work, right? How do these drugs work? The way basically what happens is topical steroids enters the cycloplasm and it binds the glucocorticoid receptor. Then the glucocorticoid receptor gets activated, moves down to the nucleus, and then it, it binds to the DNA, and basically it affects its anti-inflammatory effect and by affecting the gene expression of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So that's how it works. Now, we classify the steroids in two ways, right? One with the potency. We go usually in this country class one to class seven, one being the most potent one and seven being the weaker one. But in Europe, especially in England, they have different classification systems. They don't have seven. They basically go with uh, sort of very potent, potent, moderate, and mild. Regardless, it's the potency classification. That's what I call it. Now, there is another classification that we sort, sort of overlook it and don't think about it, and that's the allergenicity classification. And this is really important, and I'm going to discuss this in a little bit more detail as we go along. But there are four, uh, actually, there are five classes, A, B, C, D1, D2, okay? So there are five classes of allergenicity, and that depends on actually the molecular structure where, this, where the C carbon is and where the methylation, halogenation, and all that stuff is. It's a little bit uh, organic chemistry. Uh, so what determines the potency? It all depends how tightly that topical steroid binds to the glucocorticoid receptor, what is the concentration, how often we are applying, how much of it has been absorbed, because as you know, stratum corneum is a formidable, impassable barrier. First the molecule has to go across the stratum corneum in order to work. Otherwise, it's not going to do anything if it sits on your skin. So there are all different um, variables that goes into the picture to make that uh, potency right. How is that measured, by the way? You know, it's very interesting. It's a vasoconstrictor assay. It's called Stoughton vasoconstrictor assay. You take the steroid, you apply it on your wall or forearm, healthy skin, and this is important to remember, nothing to do with psoriasis or dermatitis, it's healthy skin. You cover it with occlusive dressing, wait for 16 hours, and then as you know, because of the vasoconstriction, you get blanching of that skin, and you measure that blanching, and then that's called the area under the curve, and that's how they measure the strength. The larger that blanching is the area, the higher the potency is. Now, remember, this has nothing to do with its therapeutic efficacy. That doesn't mean that it works on dermatitis, it works on psoriasis. That doesn't mean that it clear lesions. It is really a very subjective way of doing things that basically, if you know how to do that vasoconstrictor essay, in all honesty, you can do it in your basement. That's really how that simple it is. 
Okay, so that brings us to the uh, potency issue. Now, how about the allergenicity classes? And that all depends on where that modification is for each, um, for each class. And again, I am not gonna dwell on it too much because it does get complicated and we don't have the time, but remember there's A, B, C, D1, and D2, and they all may cross-react depending on which one. For example, B and D1 and D2 cross-react quite a bit. Uh, the least allergenicity, almost no allergenicity, is one class, and that's class C. Just remember that. Now, steroid allergy is sort of under-discussed uh, issue. But if you think about it, and if you talk to contact dermatitis experts, one of them is in a, among us, I don't know where is David, uh, but um, if you talk to them, they say that, you know, this is uh, interesting because if you're treating a patient with atopic dermatitis and you're sure of the diagnosis, then the treatment, you know, they should respond to topical corticosteroids, right? If they don't, my professor used to say either your diagnosis is wrong or your treatment is wrong. But if neither is wrong, your diagnosis is correct, your treatment is correct, what's going on? Maybe, maybe the patient is allergic to that topical corticosteroid. Now, the allergy can be either to the molecule itself that we discussed, or it can be to an ingredient in the vehicle. That we don't know, but it can be either or. And sometimes it's both. When you go through this class of A, B, C, D1, D2, when most of the time the percentage of the population is allergic to is about one to two percent. But I want you to re uh, remember something. How many topical corticosteroid prescriptions do you write a day? A lot, 10, 15, 20, five days a week, that's 100 prescriptions, multiply that by 50, that's almost uh, 5,000 prescriptions. You take that 5,000 prescription, one to 2% of it, you're talking about 100 prescriptions, if not more. So that's quite a bit, that's almost 10 people who might be steroid allergic a month. And we miss them if we don't think about them. And honestly, until I found out this and I learned about it, I never thought about it. So there is a big population of people that might be allergic to steroids and we're missing them and we always blame on, well, they are non-compliant. Not everybody is non-compliant. People come to you, they get the medicine, they buy the medicine, they do wanna get better and they try to use it. Well, it's tachyphylaxis. Maybe there is no such thing as tachyphylaxis. Maybe they are allergic to the steroid. So I just want you to have that in the back of your mind because this is sort of not that much discussed uh, for one reason or another. Uh, according to numbers, almost 10 to 20% of all these adults who, have, uh, who don't respond, they might have a steroid allergy. It's more common in kids, 25% of them, because those atopic kids, we keep using the steroid over and over and over, and eventually they may develop that steroid allergy. On top of that, if they're allergic to an ingredient in the vehicle, now it's double whammy. Just think about it. On top of that, some of those patients have cross allergenicity. 85% of these patients have multiple steroid allergy. That means you switch them from A to D1, they might have cross allergy that they're allergic to D1 too. So you have to think about all those things. I should say the safest one or the least possible allergy is class C. And for class C, it's less than 0.2%. It's almost non-existent. There are only two topical corticosteroids in class C, desoxymetasone and clocortolone pivolate. Those are the only two topical corticosteroids that are class C that you are not gonna cause a steroid allergy. I think that's pretty important. Now, we are lucky, you know, in dermatology we get new molecules, new vehicles really, but you know it, I know it every day in our offices. If you sit next to my fax machine, how many prior authorization requests we get. Generics, substitution, it's, it's a reality. It's, it's the reality of today's medical practice. We just have to deal with it. And most of the time, the path of least resistance and giving up to substitution 
That's what we do. It's a fact of life, unfortunately. So in my mind, generics really do matter. You need to know what your patients are getting, what generics are getting. How are the generics approved in this country? Have you ever thought about it? It's really an important thing to know because what's the mechanism, what's the process for the generics to get approved? So basically the government says that your generic drug has to have uh, bio significant bioavailability of your branded product. That's a reasonable thing. What is the significant? Significant means 20%. So it can be 20% below or above your reference drug. In this case, your reference drug is the branded product. And that's very easy to measure when you do oral medication, right? But how do you do for the topical steroids? So topical steroids, and also, by the way, you have to do clinical studies to get approved for every topical except the topical steroids. Topical steroids can get approved by just showing that, remember the vasoconstrictive assay I, I was talking about? Just to show the potency. So if you, you can take a generic topical, topical corticosteroid and show that that vasoconstriction assay was about 20% above or below the branded product vasoconstriction assay, then you can get that drug approved without a single clinical study, without testing on a single patient, without knowing if it's going to work for your atopic dermal psoriasis or whatever you're doing. So it is an amazing process. This is totally legal. This is how it's done. Now, I want you to think of something else. What does that 20% mean? So the 20% can go down uh, on each side, so your drug can be 80% efficacious of the branded product, or it can be 125% more efficacious of your branded product. I want you to think about, go back to your training days, and think about these poor old people who were on Coumadin. And every week they go back and forth to the lab to get their PTPTT regulated. Why is that? Because they are not getting the same generic. It would have been great if there is only one generic of each product that they get that generic, then you know exactly what they are getting. So this week they got the one that's on the basically the, let's say, the 80%, right? Great. Next month they're going to get the same thing. But when you get that generic drug, you're getting the generic de jour. Whichever is discounted, that's what they are getting. So maybe this month they get the one that's basically around 80%. Next month, all of a sudden, they get 125%. My God, their PTPTT is out of the whack. Think about the same thing with your topical corticosteroids. How many times it happens that you write a prescription, patient goes back and does really well. Two months later, comes back. He says, you know what? My rush is back. My eczema is back. I really like that cream. Give it to me. It worked really well. And you give it another, you give the same prescription. But the patient calls back and says, Doc, this is not working. This, this time it's not working. My disease is worse. Really, maybe his disease is not worse. It's probably maybe he got the generic. Last time maybe he got the generic that was here. Maybe this month now I got the generic. It's here. So it's not going to be as efficacious. So the problem with the generics, there isn't only one. There are so many different ones that every time you write it, you don't know what your patient is getting. And this is the biggest problem that we face right now. So, getting back to our story, what do we do? Wouldn't it be nice if there is one generic that only you know you trust that it's the same as your branded product? Then that would be great. Now, I also said, you know, the vehicle matter, right? Because what's in the vehicle, it's also important. So I'm going to ask you this question. I take betametasone dipropion at 0.05% cream. Is it the same potency as the ointment or the lotion? Here, let me show you the answer. I can take the same steroid molecule with exactly the same concentration, 0.05%, and put it in different vehicles and change the absolute potency of that medication. 
Betamethasone dipropionate 0.05%. Branded product diprozin lotion can be class five. And then diprozin, uh, diprozin ointment, class two. Or diproline cream, the same concentration, class one. And then diproline ointment uh, or diproline cream AF, class two. So by taking that vehicle and adding more penetration enhancers such as propane glycol, which makes that active molecule to go through the stratum corneum and get it getting absorbed more, you can actually increasing that potency. But remember what I said, how the generics get approved? Just with the statin, uh, the vasoconstrictive assay. So the, they don't even look at the vehicle. All they looked at that vasoconstriction assay area under the curve. Nothing to do with the vehicle. What if the vehicle irritates the hell out of your skin patient? It doesn't matter because it passed the test. What if the vehicle is so greasy, patient doesn't like it? What if the vehicle is full of ingredients that causes the allergic dermatitis? It doesn't matter because they didn't check it and they don't have to check it. So in this case, vehicles really do matter. What are the vehicles in the generic that those patients are getting? That they may have allergy to it, they, it may or it may not work. Then on top of that now, we have the allergenicity issue. Remember, the patients can be allergic not only to the molecule itself, but also to the vehicle. So wouldn't be nice, wouldn't be nice if we take just the class C topical steroids because we know the molecule itself has no allergenicity and we put it in a vehicle also, that's gonna help us. But how are we gonna deal with the generic issue? So wouldn't it be nice if there is one generic that's exactly the same as the branded product? And that's basically is the issue and that's what we're facing in dermatology. However, there are two products now. This slide is a little bit old. This says that the only topical steroid available in the United States that generic is the same as the branded product is dazoxymethasone ointment 0.05%. Remember, it's a class C steroid. The vehicle is purely white petrolatum and mineral oil. So now you have a class C steroid with a pure vehicle that really does not cause any contact dermatitis or any allergenicity. And I was able to say that up to about six months ago because that was the only topical steroid. Now I have to put an addendum. We have another product, ironically, another class C steroid, which has no allergenicity, and that's clocortolum pivolate 0.1% cream. Exactly the same generic, the same vehicle as the branded product. So what do we gain? Now we have two products with exactly the same generic, with the same branded product, with the same vehicle, that patients have more access. And this type of generics are very welcome to our practice because when you write that prescription, I don't care if they get the branded product or the generic, you know what they are getting and you feel safe about it and you don't have to worry about it. So hopefully, this is gonna be the trend. I think this is what we're facing in dermatology and this is the way to future. With the caveat that until a second generic comes, then we're back to square one. Thank you with your, for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer any time.